Hey guys, Dr. Marshall Lemoyne with PhysioU and welcome to the teaching table. I'm here with two DPT3 students, Chris and Cam, and today we're going to be talking about manipulations or now kind of known as high velocity, low amplitude thrusts, right? Previously known as grade fives. So lots of names for it. Um, yeah, and so let's kind of start with some questions. Um, first, would just how do you bring this up to your patient? I know some people, you know, maybe be a little bit fearful um, with the high high thrust manipulation, but how would you just approach the setup um, and discussing this with your patient? All right. Um, well, I'd say as I'm going through my exam, it's not like in the top of my head I'm thinking, like, oh, I'm going to cavitate this patient or I'm going to have a, a thrust. Um, so it's kind of just going through the exam. And if I decide, like, hey, this patient would benefit from it, um, I always ask if they've ever had it performed before, right? There's a study that said it was regarding thoracic spine manipulations, so the flexion extensions, and the only adverse effect that they were able to find up, that they came out with, was pre manip was someone who had a previous bad experience with a manip. So if you're worried about a thoracic manipulation with your patient, the study showed having a previous experience of a bad outcome with a thoracic manipulation was the only one out of everything else, right? So it's like, oh, so ask them, hey, have you ever, have you ever had your neck cavitated before? I try not to say the word adjusted or popped or whatever. I, I try to use a little bit more better term. Have you ever had your neck cavitated or to see what they say or your lumbar, your lower back, have you had it cavitated before? And hopefully that leads to what does that mean? Like, oh, I'm not sure what you mean. So it makes it a little bit more medically, you know? Oh, it's where, you know, we kind of put you through a quick stretch and sometimes you might hear a pop in your spine or something like that. Um, but we just kind of put a quick stretch and try to get your joint to move a little better. So that's my, my go through. Um, I try not to say the word manipulation. I try to say the word adjustment. Um, I may say, hey, have you ever had your neck mobilized? All right, um, what do you mean by that? It's like, well, you know, we try to move some of the joints, kind of make them a little looser. Sometimes we can do it slow. Sometimes we can do like a fast one where you might hear a noise, no big deal. Um, so I kind of, that, that's my lingo for them. So quick stretch, a high speed mobilization. You may hear a noise, cavitation. Because we don't, I don't want patients to think they were out of alignment, and I have to readjust them back into alignment. We don't want them walking around thinking that. So, good question. When doing a manipulation, what are the contraindications to them? Oh, there's, there's, there can be a lot, right? Um, so it depends on what body part you're you're going to go after. So if we think about the cervical spine, which is the one that has the most red flags and caution behind it, right? Um, so you want to know about your your D's and your N's, right? So. Think about your um, five Ds, three Ns, so nystagmus, all that stuff, uh, diplopia, double vision, drop attacks. Ask about that with patients. Um, we think about some of the common ones that might make somebody unstable. So do they have any ligament instability? Do they have any fractures? Are they a possibility of ligament instability, meaning they have things where they've taken a lot of steroids, so asthma, chronic asthma. Uh, they're someone who might have a risk for a fracture, so osteoporosis. So those are people that are also contraindications um, that I would want to worry about. Um, people with nerve root pathology, right? So they have radiating arm pain, leg pain. Um, they have any type of neurological reflex. We're probably going to do any high velocity thrusts to that spine because we want to make sure we're we want to just play it safe, right? Now, if someone just has some numbness and tingling in their leg, right, but their reflexes are normal, myotome is normal. I have no problem performing a thrust on that patient, knowing I've checked for safety of that patient. Yeah. Um, good question. I would say, based on each region, there's kind of a list of ones that we'll throw up on a PowerPoint that you should be aware of, um, just for safety. Yep. And with uh, the CPRs, what's a, just an easy way to kind of remember those? Uh, well, the, the nice thing is because um, manipulation or high velocity so is kind of like a, a hot topic, there's a lot of research that are trying to find out who would benefit best from it. Um, and so there's kind of clinical prediction rules almost for a lot of different ones based on it. And so the, the most common one is the lumbar one, right? Where you think it's less than 16 days, right? Less than 19 on their FABQ, right? Greater than 35 hip internal rotation ability. So if you think about 16 days plus 19 on their FABQ, 16 plus 19 is 35. So that's an easy one to remember, just do the math. Um, and do they have more than 35 degrees of internal rotation, meaning it's probably not a hip issue, right? It means we don't need to worry about their hip, it's probably more of a back issue. And then the last two components are, is this really a localized back pain problem, meaning the pain doesn't radiate past the knee, so less likely neural, less likely disc, it's something lumbar. Um, and then lastly would be, oh, when I palpate, is there a segment that was hypomobile? 
right? So if you can remember that one, right, that's the most common one. That's the one that's been, um, they've redone studies on to kind of validate, and it's been validated again. If you can remember that, all the other ones, so the one for the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, they all follow the similar pattern, right? What is the timeline, right? One of them says, oh, it's less than 38 days. Another one's less than 90 days. They all follow pain location. Is it localized versus radiating? They all have some type of psychosocial aspect. What is their FABQ? The lower, the better, right? So nice thing is that kind of you understand the pattern. You may not remember exactly what is the degree. Oh, it was 30 degrees of thoracic extension they needed in order to have a benefit. I say those aren't as important as remembering the theory, the theme behind it. Right, relatively acute, localized pain, not too fearful. Right, they all follow that. But good question. Um, I think when we when we talk about high velocity, low amplitude thrust, right, there is this fear factor, right. And one of the things that we uh, we talk about when I teach this to the fellows is that you know the person performing the manip shouldn't have a higher cortisol level than the patient on the table having a manip done to them. You should both be relatively low. The patient should feel comfortable, but the therapist should feel comfortable as well. And that's tough because unless you've done them a lot on patients, right, you got to practice somewhere. There's, there's always going to be, that was my first patient. So the more you can practice these with, um, with students, right, with interns, with uh, classmates, the more you can practice it and get comfortable, the better you're more, the more likely you are going to do actually do it on a patient. With that being said, when it's time to do it on a patient for the first time, you're probably still not going to feel comfortable because that person has pain. So start to practice with, th with thrusts that you are very confident with, right? So ones that aren't very scary. So such as an ankle dorsiflexion manip, right? Or a leg pull, right? So some of those distraction manips, right? You should feel very, very comfortable and confident that, hey, you know what? There's not a big wind up. The patient's laying there. You're not having to twist their spine. It's pretty easy. As you start to become more and more confident with those, then you get to start to move closer to, hey, low back and thoracic are relatively safe and you get confident. And then you start practicing cervical. Um, yeah, so just, so practice building in just that, uh, that speed into your clinic to build your confidence. Right? Um, and then just kind of remember to tell yourself, if you do the right, if you ask the right questions and you go through the right checklists, they're safe, right? There's a systematic review I pulled up, a more current one, that looked at adverse, aspect, adverse effects of cervical manipulations, since those have the biggest uh, risk factor with, you think about the vertebral artery and stuff, and they said, that there is no risk of these. There's a very, very low risk of these if you ask the appropriate questions. There was no trauma. They didn't have any dizziness or nystagmus. All, if, if all those things have been cleared out, right, then there's no ad adverse effects. The people that had the adverse effects when they narrowed down were the people that had, um, they had some type of trauma to their neck or they had other symptoms that could have been cleared out with better questioning. So, so they're safe if we're using them appropriately. Okay. So, so with that being said, why don't we go over some of the common clinical prediction rules for each one, and we'll demonstrate some of these spinal manips. So okay. for the, the clinical prediction rule for a cervical high-velocity low-thrust amputation is symptoms less than 38 days, so again, acute, 10 degrees difference in rotation. So if we look at right rotation versus left rotation, either passively or him actively doing it, there's a 10 degree difference, meaning there's probably some type of mobility issue. When we did PAs, we were able to identify some type of pain and stiffness at a level. And then we asked them, hey, have you ever had your neck cavitated before, right? Where someone's done a quick stretch and maybe there's a pop or that, mm -hmm. no? Are you worried about having that done at all? No. Okay, perfect. So a positive experience, a potential positive experience. If he says, oh man, I'm super worried, that made the outcomes less. So those would be our things. So as we go through it, we already know the level based on doing an assessment of which one was the stiffest. So if we're gonna wind it up, right? We wanna wind up with a side bend, go ahead and relax, a side bend, side glide. We don't wanna wind up with rotation first, right? Cause that's where you can stress the vertebral artery. So it's a side bend, side glide. So relax, I gotcha. Side bend, side glide. My body turns with them to get in position, right? Here we then wanna do some rotation to find our end feel, right? So that would be our wind up, right? Side bend, side glide, rotation, a relative slight PA, and then the manip is a rotational up glide manip. That's our neutral gap. The hold I have here is called a cradle versus you can do the same thing with a chin hold where it's side bend, side glide, rotate, and then your manip is that way. So it's the same manip whether you wanna do a chin hold or a cradle hold, All right? So a loosey goosey. So side bend, side glide, rotate, and that would be it. 
three, two, one, okay. go. For CTJ, cervical thoracic junction, high velocity thrust, the clinical prediction rule is less than 90 days, right? They're not having to take medication for their pain, meaning it's not severe pain, right? It's, they have a negative NEARS, meaning it's not necessarily a shoulder pathology. Um, they have good shoulder range of motion, so greater than 127 is the number, but just think they have good range in the shoulder, negative impingement test. They have good internal rotation of their shoulder, so uh, 53 degrees in the glenohumeral joint. So we think about, hey, you know what? This person that has this kind of shoulder, upper thoracic pain, it's not coming from the shoulder. We did these shoulders look negative, so then let's treat the thoracic junction. Right? So here, you're kind of holding their, your, their forehead under your hand. Use your thumb to wind up and block the lateral aspect of the spinous process. So here I'm on T1, side bend towards that, and then rotate away. As I rotate away, I wanna make sure I pin them with my thumb and my thumb so that he stays locked up. From here, I transfer my hand to then block on a zygomatic area to help stabilize his head. Here my hand swings over to the other side to get a nice tissue lock, and then you're thrusting through this angle towards the scapula, all right? Let's do it again. So I'd say the biggest thing is this wind up when they're here to here. How do, I don't wanna necessarily take my hands off to change because then we lose it. So it's kind of learning to spin on your thumbs, all right? So chin down, good. So loosey-goosey, I gotcha. So block lateral aspect, side bend, rotate, spin, take a deep breath in, breathe out, spin. Good, and then help them out of it. Another option for CTJ manip would be having the patient place the direction they're gonna to look to, place that hand up, turn your head to that side. Good, so that kind of winds up the cervical spine. Again, your hand is on the same location on their cheek to kind of create a little bit of stabilization. The other hand's on the lateral aspect of the spinous process. Kind of grab some of the upper trap to help you to be able to push. If I'm just pushing like this, that's a small surface on a bone that can be painful. So I'm kind of grabbing this whole area to thrust that way. This kind of creates a block, so I'm not really pushing too hard. The push is here, right? Just kind of find a rhythm and thrust. The prediction rule for a thoracic spine thrust is for people with neck pain. So the idea is they've had symptoms less than 30 days. There's no symptoms that go past the shoulder, meaning it's a localized issue. Um, when they look up, it does not aggravate their symptoms. So maybe again, maybe we shouldn't be treating neck and we'll treat a little bit lower down. They're not fearful, so FABQ of less than 12. Um, they have a diminished upper thoracic kyphosis and their cervical extension range is less than 30 degrees. So what does that all mean? They have neck pain that doesn't travel. They're not fearful, it's not chronic. When they look up, it doesn't hurt, but they have limited range. That's kind of what that prediction rule is telling us. So we're gonna work on giving them a thrust here. And they did two types, they did, in the article they actually did three. They did a flexion extension and they did a distraction option. So we're gonna work on the extension and then the flexion or the prone and supine. And so for here, if we've identified, we did PAs, we identified either the painful or the stiff and we're gonna wind it up. So again, using palm, we don't need to go just like this pisiform, right? It's okay to use your fingers to help wind up tissue. The more fascial and skin and tissue I can wind up, the more likely I'm gonna be able to go through to actually this joint level, right? So wind that up. Here, again, start up, wind it up, keep my fingers down, right? It kind of helps to block or it helps to disguise some of the pressure. I know some people are taught this way, but then that puts all of your pressure on their pisiform. So let's open it up a tad, good. Take a deep breath in. My chest is over them and breathe out. All right, I make sure I look up before I thrust, right? If I'm crunched down like this thrusting, it's hard for me to produce any power. So I wanna make sure here, they call this like a lat lock where I lift up and I almost depress my scapulas to get a lat lock. So I have all my weights over him. Good. If we flip you over, go supine. So, right, I'm gonna stick something inside my fingers just to prevent hyperflexion, right? But arms across your chest, good. The idea is we wanna wind their arms up to create almost like a barrier though, so that way if I thrust, it's not all of his shoulders. He has pretty loose shoulders, so we're actually gonna add something in the middle here to create tension. If we can create tension at his shoulders, 
and then I can then use that. So stick that through you. You okay? Mm -hmm. There you go. So that's better there. Okay. So bend this knee. Good. And you're going to roll towards me. Good. Again, I kind of find that segment that I want to thrust at. Start above, right? And I'm going to wind up tissue. So I start with my finger pointing up towards scapula and neck and then wind it up so it's facing towards the opposite shoulder. His spinous process should sit in this gutter here, right? So the spinous process should not be on my bone. Otherwise, it's painful for me, painful for him, right? So I'm winding up. It's in that gutter. Add a little bit of compression so when I roll him over, it doesn't move, right? So now my chest is on him. All right, lift your head up. Good. I can play with it a little bit here where it's off my fingers, on my fingers, off my fingers, on my fingers to make sure, hey, yep, that's where I like it. Take a deep breath in, breathe out. Follow him in, good, and roll off. Perfect. For a lumbo or lumbo pelvic thrust, the clinical prediction rule is, again, that most common one, pain less than 16 days, so pretty acute, an FABQ of less than 19, so they're not too worried about it. One hip that has greater than 35 degrees of rotation, meaning they have good hip mobility. We PA'd and they have a hypomobile segment and the pain is pretty localized to the back, but like it doesn't radiate past the knee, meaning we can take out any type of disc or nerve pathology, most likely. So sideline involves side up for this neutral gap, right? We're gonna straighten out the lower leg, right? The top leg I'm gonna put in my hip pocket and I'm just gonna kinda of go through flexion and extension. And again, there are lots of different ways that people have been learned to wind up and manip. Um, this is just kinda of the one that I do, and I look for when the segment that I want to perform the technique on, the one below opens up, then that one opens up and I stop, lock his foot. I kinda of keep that there. I keep my hip there as best as I can. All right, let me relax this. Let me take your lower arm, good. Now for here, right, I'm just gonna wind him up. Ideally, it'd be nice if there was a sheet underneath him so he's not so sticky, right? Wind him up. If I let go of my leg now, his leg should stay up, right? If I, if I wound him up enough, tension should hold this up, which it did. Let's say I let go and it fell down, it means I didn't wind him up enough. So I'm happy with this because his tension is keeping his leg up. All right, so have him hold his arm. Don't use your ulnar border, that's painful on people's ribs. So kind of try to pronate to use the meaty part. Same thing here. I don't want to be like this. That's bony border. So try to get some meat of your forearm on this area. And then just kind of play with where is their tension, right? So if I wind up this, so I say, hey, you know what? There's some tension there. And I'm going to roll him underneath me. I don't want him a nip with him here. Tension, keep the tension, roll him towards me. And then you think about the same thing we did with thoracic, right? Try to do like a lat lock, sit up nice and tall. Make sure there's tension. Good. Deep breath in, breathe out, follow him, and then help him out of it. Good. So if we recap, thrusts are safe if we ask the appropriate questions and do the appropriate screening, right? They're effective, right? All the, all the prediction rules and the guidelines give them an A rating, right? So they're safe, um, they're effective. And then the benefit to them, right? There's lots of benefits, not only just this mobility deficit problem, but there's a lot of research that talks about just pain gating and neuro, neurological changes um, in terms of breakthrough of pain, improved range of motion, um, ability to activate muscles better. So we should use them in our practice. And the only way we're going to use them is if we become more comfortable and practice them. So practice on each other if it's safe. Um, the out, the out, the long-term goal should not always be to get a cavitation, right? It's nice when we do. You kind of feel rewarded for it. But studies show that even without a cavitation, just the thrusting itself, that quick stretch, um, patients get benefits from it. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed and you learned something. Uh, take a look at all of our social media accounts um, and drop us a line, give us a like, as well as go to physiou.com and take a look at our mentoring minutes and teaching tables. Hope all is well, guys, and we'll talk to you later. Take care.